Thank you. Um, yeah, it was, uh, as I remember, it was an eight-hour economics lecture rather than a conversation, but there we are. Um, welcome, uh, welcome to our uh, crazy building. Uh, like too many things in this world, it's a lot of style over substance. Uh, it looks great, but it's actually a terrible building to work in. It's what they call an intelligent building, right, which we all know means it doesn't work. So if it gets a bit hot today or nothing, the loos don't flush or we do have a rodent problem. If you see our little furry friends, um, it's, not our, it's not our problem. Um, uh, it's Nor Lord Norman Foster who right, designed this and the gherkin over the road and lives in a 18th century schloss in Switzerland. Right? All those modern architects, please note, they always live in buildings more than 200 years old. Anyway. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here. My name is Kip Olson. I'm the Deputy Mayor for Business and Enterprise, which means I basically have to wander around the city uh, talking to specialist groups of people pretending that I know what I'm uh, talking about. I was at a synthetic biology conference, um, I guess about three or four months ago, and uh, I started by telling what I thought was a joke. I said I'd looked at their technology, and uh, it struck me that synthetic biology was the technology that could finally wipe out the human race, right? They didn't laugh. They all looked at their papers and shuffled their thing, and it's true, they are going to But anyway, so I wander around uh, pretending that I know what I talk about. So when Mariana said to me, look, we've got this academic day, could you come and talk to all these academics about uh, what you're trying to do? I was slightly, uh, I guess, slightly intimidated. Uh, I did actually do an economics degree uh, many, many uh, years ago, the high point of which was I wrote an essay in my final year. Um, I got an alpha. Uh, for an essay entitled Keynes Will Eat Himself. Um, and my, my professor at the time, uh, she wrote at the bottom, she wrote Alpha. She said, content's a gamma, but I like your style. Um, which I guess is style over substance. Anyway, um, so Mariana said to me when I should speak to you, I, she said, to, talk to me about what you're doing to foster innovation and creativity and invention here in the city. Which is a slightly tricky one, really, because it's like saying to somebody, how are you planning to be spontaneous? Right? This is a, a difficult thing for governments. How do you harness? How do you stimulate? How do you make people creative? It's, a, it's an odd one uh, for us. Um, but in, in my particular role, I guess I'm slightly unusual. Um, in politics in that I have, I like to think, been sort of vaguely creative in my past. I've run a, a business life in parallel with my political life. I still own and, and sort of manage my own uh, small business. Um, I've been involved in five startups, actually, of which two are still going. Two for five is not bad, is it? Venture capital-wise, right? Nine out of ten, two for five, that works. Um, I actually have two patents in my name. I've invented two products. I never turned them into anything, but I have those registered. It was on my bucket list to do, and I have them. So I do, I guess, know a little bit about um, uh, what it takes. Against that, just to give you a bit of backdrop, here I am, the Deputy Mayor for Business and Enterprise in London. With London is an economy, I guess, we're about 10, 15 percent bigger than the whole of Austria. Um, and they've given me a budget of about 200 million and a team of 25 people. Now, if the economy minister of Austria came to you and said, this is what I've got, um, you would smile and think he or she is not going to make a huge amount of difference. And to a certain extent, that's true. Um, but what it has imposed on us is a need to focus. Too often, in my experience, I've been in city government now for 15 years, too often, in my experience, government spreads the jam too thin. They try and please too many people. They never focus um, and try and make a really big difference in a small number of areas rather than a marginal, if no difference, in, in many. So we are focusing. Um, I just thought I'd talk to you about the four areas and then how they connect with what you're talking about today. The first for us that's easy one for us is infrastructure, right? London benefits from the agglomeration effect. It is a huge, um, uh, dense area. The machine needs to work, and that's not just transport. We're, we're investing billions. Uh, Crossrail, a big, the biggest civil engineering project in, in Europe at the moment, is grinding its way. The boring machines have met just over to the east here, um, grinding its way. Across London, the stations are popping up. It will add 10% capacity to our entire network. It'll be huge. We're extending the northern line down to Battersea, opening up that whole area for um, development. Crossrail 2, connecting uh, southwest with northeast, is on the blocks, all that stuff. But also broadband, power. Our water system is being renewed at the moment. Um, you know, we're looking at how we deal with our waste. 
all of that machinery where we've often been surviving as a city of Victorian infrastructure. Some of it built you know, 150, 200 years ago is all going through a big period of renewal and we're investing a fair amount of money in that. Uh, the second area that we're focusing on is skills. We have a lot of young people here in the city, parts of the city, uh, particularly to the east. If you look at the demographics, have a, a profile that's not dissimilar to a developing nation. Big bulge of young people down below 30. Um, all of whom need skills to operate in what is an incredibly fast-moving economy now. There are jobs existing in London that didn't exist uh, when I first came here 20 odd years ago. My kids, as they grow uh, through the generations, will face a change, ever-changing, seemingly accelerating rate of change uh, in the jobs market. Uh, if we want those knowledge economies, uh, knowledge jobs, we have to make sure young people have the skills. At the moment, our skills are a bit random, probably like you and me. Um, uh, at the moment, young people go into academia, school, training, whatever it might be, um, on the basis of something they're enthusiastic about. And then they take a punt that there's going to be a job at the end. Uh, rather than industry saying to us, in three, five, ten years' time, these are the jobs and the skills we will need, please um, give young people those skills now so we can use them in the future. And we're seeing that in coding. Right? So in uh, computer software coding, we've got a huge digital economy now in the city. One in four new jobs in London is generated in, in digital uh, industries, in technology uh, generally. And because we don't have the homegrown skills, we're sucking in talent from overseas. Um, two and a half thousand uh, new Londoners, actually either born or largely arriving every single week at the moment. The city is growing by about a million people every decade. Incredible amounts of, of migration into the city that we're seeing on a regular basis. That's all because there are jobs and skills requirements here. Uh, the third area uh, of concentration for us is, is an area that's close to my heart, and that is small business. Um, as I say, I still own my own small business. It's taken me 20 years to build it up. I can proudly say I'm one of the few politicians who's created jobs through the sweat of my own brow and the work of my hands rather than just talked about it. Um, and so I felt that pain and pleasure along the way. And it's always frustrated me that when uh, politicians stand up and talk about business, they always wheel out a, a FTSE 100 chief executive or a Forbes 500 chief executive. They pretend that's business. Well, it isn't really. Those enormous businesses, a bit of branding and accounting and you know, marketing, and that's about it. Small business is actually uh, where it is out there, hewing your living from the rock on a daily basis, risking your own capital. And they don't get enough assistance. Um, uh, here in the UK. Over those 20 years, I've had nothing but pain from the government, uh, never any help. Well, that's going to change, we hope, in London, um, and in particular in a couple of areas. The first is on finance. I know you're talking about financing innovation today, um, and one of the issues we have in this country, even though we're good at discovering and creating things, is we're not very good at investing in them anymore. We don't have a small ticket venture capital industry that's worth the name in the UK that evaporated some time ago. Um, of the investments in the UK made under two million pounds, the government is making 60% at the moment. Um, and that's actually off quite a small base. We're not planting the acorns um, that we need to to create those massive oak trees that we've spent the last 20 or 30 years selling to the rest of the world. Um, and certainly we're not building the multi-generational businesses of which our, our, our um, uh, economy was founded um, pre and post the war. There's this interesting statistic that of the top, the biggest 500 companies in the world, only three have been started in Europe in the last 40 years. Uh, we have lots of 18th and 19th century companies that populated, but we don't have many really post-war. Two of those are in the UK. One's Virgin, one's Vodafone. I can't remember who the third one is. It might be Spanish. But that's a slightly frightening statistic. Uh, for a city that survived off these huge companies. Of course, when I first came to London, all those big companies had family names. Smith and Nephew, uh, Reckitt Bannister, Procter and Gamble, Marks and Spencer. Now they've all got made-up names, right? Because they've been taken over, part of the M&A churn. So planting some of those acorns, and we're about to launch a city venture capital fund, probably about 100 million quid to start with, hopefully doubling in time, we have a couple of smaller funds that have been operating for some time. The idea being <clears throat> that we can invest in some of these businesses ourselves, leveraging in private sector money. We think we can get three to one and do essentially what the market isn't doing, which is providing the 25, 50, 150,000 pounds, dollars, whatever you like, to get those businesses started. Um, the third area, and I guess the two are related, the fourth area, sorry, of concentration for us is about um, uh, science and technology. 
Um, we talk a lot about financial services in this city. We love it. Uh, the boys and girls over the river there uh, pay for everything we do. They contribute 63 billion uh, to the economy. Uh, they pay for us, for Scotland, Wales, combined, no hard feelings. Uh, they're fantastic. But as we learned from in 2008, <clears throat> having a monoculture economy uh, can be tricky. Um, they're a bit like a bad dog, right? We love them, we feed them, but every now and again they keep biting us in the backside. Um, uh, and so we felt the time was right to start to diversify. And when we scratched the surface, of course, of London's economy and looked at where we might have other strengths, we discovered that we have incredible strength in science and technology. When you put London together with our suburban neighbors in Oxford and Cambridge on an academic basis, we actually have probably the largest agglomeration of scientific research on the planet. When you add that to our history, we look like the most powerful discovery engine the world has ever seen here in Southeast England. Incredible numbers of Nobel Prizes, of inventions over the last two or three hundred years in all manners of science and technology, and yet we've never talked about it. We've never leveraged it uh, from an economic point of view. We've never positioned ourselves as the landing place for science and technology and innovation in Europe. And so that's what we've decided to do. And our objective over the next couple of decades is that science and technology, including digital, um, should rise to be as important to the London and the southeast of England economy as financial services is. They currently employ about the same number of people. Uh, one earns a lot, money, a lot more money than the other does. Our, our universities, we have five of the top 40 universities here. That's a greater collection than any other part of the world. It's more than the whole of Japan, all in and around one city. It's all very well investing billions in them as we are, um, unless they can find the venture capital so that when they lob the cricket ball out, somebody's there to catch it and turn it into a product and a business, then all of it becomes ultimately pointless. Um, it all ends up in the States where it's commercialized or in the Far East where it's miniaturized and exploited. And so we're trying to retain those people here and putting those pieces together, great infrastructure, access to finance, the skills that people need, and then recognizing that this is a discovery engine, building the cluster, attracting participants from around the world, investing in our, our uh, universities is absolutely uh, key. There is one other thing, just to finish, which we think is incredibly important. And that, I guess, comes down to the, back to the first question that I was asked, which is how do you foster innovation? How do you plan to be uh, spontaneous? Well, the truth is we're not really uh, planning to foster innovation. We're not doing anything specific other than recognizing that innovation happens somewhere, and it's done by some people. Um, and they generally tend to be people who are incredibly stimulated. Um, that, have a, that can cross-fertilize with other influences, that can look at other aspects of life, that can have um, uh, the, the um, ability to interact with other disciplines. And so what we try to do uh, with London is to create a city that, is, that has a product that is a great place to live, that is incredibly stimulating and mixed. When I first came to London, we used to talk about uh, Frankfurt as a rival city. Everybody would say, oh, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, it's very Frankfurt financial services, they're going to whack us out. We've got to look at Frankfurt. And of course, now Canary Wharf on its own, those towers out to the, uh, to the east, they're a bigger financial sector on their own than the whole of Frankfurt. And the reason is, bluntly, because Frankfurt, forgive me if anybody hears from Frankfurt, Frankfurt isn't fun, right? The, the, the phrase, darling, we're going to Frankfurt for the weekend, does not elicit the response that you want, right? Um, uh, whereas London is incredible fun. Um, it's incredibly stimulating. It's ever-changing. You know, we rip great areas of the city down and rebuild them on a 50-year cycle. We have 32,000 people a night going to the theatre. We've got some of the greatest art galleries and museums in the world. As I say, we've got these, muse these incredible universities, all of which are running cultural programs and providing incredible stimulation for scientists from artists. You know, London is a place of enormous exchange of knowledge and stimulation, and we polish that product on a constant basis. So in this building, for instance, culture and art and our cultural strategy is as important as our science strategy because we recognize that when they walk out of the lab, those scientists want to sit down next to a ballet dancer or an author or a doctor or a lawyer or a plumber or whoever it might be and get the stimulation that they need from them. Um, that they, people want to live in a place that is similar. You only have to go, do you ever see those uh, um, 
things on the TV about those horrific zoos in far-flung places where the animals pace up and down because they're in a cage with no stimulation. Right, well unfortunately there are cities around the world like that. I'm not going to name them, I've been to a few of them, but London is not like that. No one paces up and down in their cage, you never need to be bored, you can be constantly stimulated. In many ways we think that's the most valuable thing that we can do to drive the innovation engine. We could do lots of physical stuff around clusters, buildings, money, railways, connections, promotion, we can do all of that. But in many ways, it will all be artificial unless the city is a fantastic place to come and discover and be stimulated in your discovery. And that's where we concentrate the most. So I hope you have a, um, an interesting day today. You're very welcome to come here. You are part of that, of our mission to make London a stimulating place uh, where people come to exchange ideas, money, talent, uh, value, um, and build us into... Um, an even better product, if you like, for the wealth of the people here in the city, but also, we hope, for the wealth of the rest of the world. Thank you.